Hey guys, had a great discussion this morning about the uh, messages to the churches found in uh, Revelation chapter 2. Here's a review of what we discussed. So the issues for discussions were those on the screen right there. The first one we talked about was about the Nicolaitans and uh, what, what were their evil deeds in Ephesus that Jesus didn't like and what we could learn from their mistake. Um, the passage was from verse four through six, where the Lord told John to write to the church in Ephesus saying, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Which uh, made me think, as I mentioned to them that, uh, you know, each church has a lampstand. I wonder if when a church dies or a church, you know, kind of dissolves, is it because for some reason Jesus came and removed the lampstand from that church? So interesting thought there. Um, but the meat of the discussion was about these Nicolaitans, um, how Jesus apparently hated the evil deeds that they did. So... Uh, the discussion was, first of all, who were they? Who were the Nicolaitans and what did they do? Because there's not much out there about uh, that I could find on them. Um, sounds like uh, in their research, they couldn't find too much either on the Nicolaitans. Uh, first thing that was mentioned was who they were. Um, Nick... <laughs> So Nick mentioned that it was from, uh, started from the deacon Nicholas um, from Antioch, which is backed up in Acts chapter six. Um, there was a deacon named Nicholas of Antioch, which was part of the seven deacons um, when the church first started, that the church was growing exponentially and the apostles were too busy with teaching and managing the church. So they uh, commissioned these seven deacons to handle the food uh, food program. So uh, Nick had a good point. He was like, oh, maybe it was about the dietary laws and how um, they were being strict about the dietary laws found in Leviticus. So we talked a little bit about the dietary laws <clears throat> uh, found in Leviticus chapter 11. Um, that was a cool little discussion. Uh, we talked about the healthiness of that diet that God gave us forth. Um, in Leviticus 11, but also the the purpose of it, right? That it's it's healthy for our bodies. It's healthy to follow that dietary laws, but taking it too far could have been what they were doing um, in the early church. As far as going as far as saying, you know, if you don't follow these dietary laws, you're you're not saved or you're not going to hell. Um, so we got into a little discussion on that, on how the law is good, the diet is good. Um, Talked about how Daniel followed the diet. Talked about how healthy the diet is for your body um, to follow it. However, it has no bearing on your actual salvation. So that was a cool uh, discussion. We also talked about the other sins found in Revelation chapter 2 um, that were repeated multiple times, like sexual immorality, how anything outside of marriage between a husband and wife is immoral. Um we got a discussion on how the Roman Empire and the pagan culture was back then, how, you know, orgies were kind of a normal thing, even tied into uh, worship, and how that was just kind of the normal everyday life thing. Um, and then all of a sudden, Christians, the gospel went into the Roman Empire and Gentiles started becoming Christians. However, they still had these practices in place. Um to give a good example, I kind of gave the example of like Christmas, you know, here in America or even before America, how the Christmas tradition of decorating a tree or putting up lights, you know, or when it got to America, this tradition about Santa Claus and the elves and the flying reindeer, how all of that has absolutely nothing to do with the birth of Christ. Um, even mentioned how the birth of Christ was actually believed to be in September time frame, in the beginning of fall, not on December 25. But what was in place was there was this tradition for the winter solstice that was already happening um, before the gospel, um, where 
on the winter solstice, they would celebrate by these pagan traditions. And then Christianity just came and pretty much hijacked it and said, okay, that's cool. You guys are all doing this. From now on, it means the birth of Christ. So kind of like that mentality uh, that was going on uh, with the early church where sexual morality, partaking in idol worship um, was kind of already in place. And then the gospel came and then the Christians kept kind of doing this because it was their normal lifestyle. Just like how though the Christmas tree has nothing to do with Christ, we just keep doing it because that's the normal lifestyle uh, here in America. So that was a cool dis uh, discussion. Talked about idol worship. Um, I mentioned how when I was in Korea last month, um, we had a couple days off, so we went to Seoul, me and a couple of Marine Corps buddies, and there was this big Buddhist temple where uh, my buddies kind of went in, they saw it as a tourist attraction. I did not go into the temple. I explained to them why I didn't go in. Um, I was able to peer in, and I saw this big golden statue of a fat dude, you know, probably the Buddha, I don't know. And it was there, and on, on the feet of this golden statue, there was little plates with food on it, and then a bunch of people just kneeling and bowing down uh, to this statue. So I obviously did not partake in any of that. Um, it's known I'm a Christian, so I kind of stayed out of it. But I mentioned it as far as the idol worship, um, where that stuff is still all around today. Um, and as Christians, we should not uh, be partaking in any of that. Um, Talked about how the reason is not because that statue has any power or is anything at all. It's just a gold, it's just a big old statue that can't do anything. But it's more for um, the purpose of if you're known as a Christian, what message are you giving? If your non believing friends or even your Christian friends see you bowing down to or partaking in any kind of idol worship, gives a mixed message there or eating any kind of food sacrifice to idol. Um, Maddie mentioned a good point about a Chinese restaurant, how she noticed idols in the Chinese restaurant and even little food or like fruits offered to uh, these idols. So you don't got to go to a Buddhist temple. You go to a Chinese restaurant and see idolatry there. It's all over the place. Um, we didn't get too much more into idolatry, but that's a big topic, um, of course, that is a big problem today, just as it was in the early church. So that was a good discussion. Um, mentioned the letter from the apostles to the uh, to the Gentile believers. We talked a little bit about what Gentiles were and how we were all Gentiles because we're not descendants of Israel, but now we're Christian, how Christ united the two people groups of Israel and Gentile. So definitely talked about how, you know, in, in reference to Israel, how we need to love Israel, be nice with everybody who's a descendant of Israel, everyone who's Jew, and there's a Jewish friend, you know, be friendly, um, because together with them, we're co-heirs in God's kingdom. Um, so talked about this letter that the apostle gave to the, the new believers, and how basically in the letter, the apostle said, abstain from eating food offered to idols, don't consume blood, talked a little bit about that, and why that's an issue. Um, I mentioned how it was believed or is still believed that if you like consume the blood of an animal, you somehow inherit the uh, the abilities of that animal. Um, like I had read some people drank the blood of bats so they can get better night vision and stuff like that. That's kind of weird, uh, but it's out there. It's out there in the world, especially in the culture where it's happening. And this is just something that God doesn't want us to partake in. Um, I know uh, Zach is going through Leviticus now. Funny, he's in Leviticus 11, which is a chapter on the dietary laws. He hasn't read it yet. I say you, you, you should go read it, especially after our discussion. But I also told him to look out for how in Leviticus, God mentions how with blood that the life of a creature is in the blood. So if you consume the blood, you're kind of taking part of the life of that creature into yourself. So that was interesting discussion as well. Uh, we talked about the meat of strangled animals, how, you know, you shouldn't just go and eat a carcass out in the parking lot and cook it up, um, the unhealthiness of it. 
Nick, Nick made a funny comment how apparently it's legal in Tennessee to do that. I didn't know it was. Uh, but we talked about how that should not be done. Even if it's legal, follow the law that the apostles gave in the book of Acts. That's That trumps any kind of uh, American legality anyways. Um, again, talked about sexual immorality um, and how that is just not what Christians should be partaking in, that it should be kept uh, within marriage between a man and a woman. And if you do this, you will do well, farewell. So here we go. The letter from the original apostles still applies to us today, not just for the early church. Um, then we got into our second issue for discussion, which was about the suffering in Smyrna. Uh, the passage was from verse 9 through 10, um, where uh, the Lord told uh, the church in Smyrna through the letter that John wrote to not be afraid of what they were about to suffer. Um, so had the students look up if, there's, if there was ever any 10-day event that they could find where Smyrna went through this suffering. Um, like me, they couldn't find any specific 10-day uh, event where the church of Smyrna um, went through suffering and this is Smyrna in Asia Minor not Smyrna Tennessee as we joked about um, but Manny brought up a good point that I didn't even know um, that apparently that church in Smyrna was one of the longest lasting churches um, almost to like the 1900s I think she said that it finally ceased to exist so that's kind of impressive um, one of the trips my wife and I want to take is out to Asia Minor to see a uh, the ruins and of these seven churches here in the next few years. So that will be a pretty cool trip. I'm looking forward to it. Um, but going back to Smyrna, um, Esther had a good point. She she brought up maybe it was in 10 days that it maybe was the uh, 10 year uh, persecution through Emperor uh, Diocletian. I think that's how you say it. Um, so that led into an interesting discussion about time. Um, is 10 days 10 days or is 10 days 10 years what about time um the letter of peter was brought up where a day to the lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day um so that was kind of cool to talk about that you know is that just a perspective thing where to god who's eternal you know a thousand years is nothing to him it's just like a day you know or a day to God who's eternal for us is like a thousand years. It's long, you know, or is it, is that heaven time? Um, are those in heaven who've been there for a thousand years? It's only felt like a day for them or vice versa. You know, that was kind of a cool thing to talk about. Um, mentioned about my daughter who's been in heaven for just over a year now. Does that mean she's only to her, it's felt like only a few seconds, you know, or a minute, whatever. Um, I don't know the math. Um, apparently some of your students uh, like math and they can figure out the proportion and all that on what a year is when a day is only a day is a thousand years to the Lord, all that stuff. So that was kind of cool talk. Um, we also talk about Diocletian and then the Emperor Nero as well and the actual persecution that they did on the church how they would light Christians on fire, how uh, Nero set part of Rome on fire and blamed the Jews and the Christians, um, how Christians were thrown into coliseums and fed to lions, and all the persecution that caused the early church to go underground and completely meet in homes. Um, we talked about how awesome it is now that we got church buildings to meet in. Back then, they couldn't. They were meeting... Um, risking their lives. Um, they had to use secret symbols like the fish, the Jesus fish that they all know about to uh, communicate and meet in secret for almost 200 years until uh, uh, Constantine, you know, and the Catholic Church uh, kind of came up and Christianity became legal again. So we talked about the Roman persecutions and the symbolic number one, the last one there, um, how 10 was a symbolic number of testing. And then Esther mentioned, you know, she, how numbers have different meanings. And that was a, a, a cool discussion. Um, I shared a story of how uh, after Zadie passed away, uh, my daughter, I kept seeing 11, 11, 
all the time. Like, it was weird. Every time I look at the clock, 11-11, you know, or I'd see 11-11 somewhere. Um, and I didn't know my wife was seeing the same thing. And one time, one day I just mentioned it like, oh, look, it's 11-11. I keep seeing 11-11. And she said, you too? I've been seeing 11-11. So my wife, uh, Sherry, went and looked it up. And apparently there's an angel number, you know, that um, someone from the dead is connecting with you. And that's just what 11-11 means. Like, you know, there's just a connection there. So, you know, I talk about how it became a kind of a cool thing in our family. My my four-year-old Eli, whenever he sees 11-11 on the clock, you know, he yells out, hi, sissy, and says hi to his sister. So, brief talk about just the numbers. Uh, didn't get too much into it, but I just shared that story. Uh, we did talk briefly, and this is more I mentioned how there is this idea with prophecy and with scripture that there's a past fulfillment, like something that literally happened in the past. There's a present fulfillment, meaning the prophecy has something to do with today. And then there's also a literal future fulfillment that's coming. So I kind of just threw that out there, uh, food for thought uh, for the students to think about. Um, the third discussion was about Satan's throne in Pergamum. Okay, this one took the meat of the hour. This is the one we talked about the most. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um Satan became a big topic today. Uh, students were very interested in Satan, which I think is a good thing. Um, as a Marine Corps officer, I've all, we were always taught, um, yeah, you know your know your job, know your training, know your weapon system, but know but then know your enemy and know how he works, know how he ticks. So after you learn what you've got, learn how he works so that you can beat him. So I think it's a healthy thing to uh, kind of really think about our enemy, how he works, how he how he ticks. Um, and we had a good discussion of it. I put on the slide here. Here's all the things that came up. And I was not planning to talk about Satan today, but I just kind of let it run its course. Um, we discussed how he's an angel. He is an angel, which means he's he's not omnipresent like God. He's not all knowing. He can't be everywhere at once. But as an angel, he is confined to one place at one time. Um, so we talked about like, you know, you often hear Christians say, oh, Satan made me do it. Satan this, Satan that. And it's like, well, if Satan is not omnipresent, you know, do you really think that Satan is going to an individual Christian? Maybe sometimes, but do you really think he's going to every individual Christian every day and trying to make him to do something? I said, most of the time it's our own sinful nature that's our biggest enemy or just society in general and dealing with the world. Um, Satan probably goes to people in influence. Um, Nick asked, he brought up a good point about Satan's intelligence. So we talked a little bit about, you know, Satan is, he's not dumb. Um, he's been doing this for a few thousand years. He knows what he's doing. He's very good at it. He's very intelligent. We talked about angels. Are they of a higher intelligence than humans? Um, wasn't too prepared for that question, but that was pretty interesting discussion that uh, Nick brought up. Um, we talked about his fallen, how there's the third and where they are today. The fallen and Satan. Um, students know he's not locked up. Satan rolls around like a purring lion. He's on earth. And his fallen are on earth as well. Um, they're down here with us. They have been kicked out of heaven. Didn't mention that because we'll talk about that when we get to uh, Revelation 12, which maybe we'll do that a little bit earlier since there's a kind of an interest in Satan right now. We'll talk about the war in heaven here, maybe in a couple weeks. But uh, we did talk about how... The, these are real beings. They're real angels. They're real beings. They're a real enemy. And they're down here on earth. And they have an agenda. Um, and they're out there. And they're somewhere. Satan is somewhere. Um, so we talked about, uh, Maddie brought up a good point about, um, I guess she's a Harry Potter fan. I've watched it. I can't say I'm a big fan of Harry Potter. But she mentioned uh, the bad guy. He starts with a V. Uh, I already forgot his name, you see? Voldemort or whatever, something something along those lines. Blah, blah. Um, how he was disembodied, he was ripped out, and then 
he was kind of disembodied until he was able to possess creatures like possess animals or eventually possess people that open himself up and all that. So we talked a little bit. Uh, Maddie's question was, you know, can Satan possess people kind of like demons do? Um, and I mentioned from scripture how uh, Judas in one of the gospels uh, during the Last Supper, it says that Satan entered into Judas and then he went and did what he had to do, you know, on betraying the Lord. So there's a uh, biblical precedence to it of Satan entering into someone. So maybe, maybe he can possess, you know, certain bodies. Um, I didn't mention the serpent at the garden. I just thought about that now. That might be a case where, you know, he possessed a creature um, in order to uh, carry out his will. Um, we started talking about different types of angels. Um, I think it was either Zach or Jake asked me what type of angel Satan is. Um, I'm unsure, but we did talk about like the different, you know, heavenly hosts, cherubim, seraphim, archangels, watchers, how there's different classes of angels, um, probably have different abilities, look different, you know. I did mention how scripture says Satan was given vocals in order to lead worship. Um, uh, Cause I think it was Jake actually who mentioned, Jake or Zach, um, that you know how Satan was higher. He was higher ranked or at least seen as a higher angel. And it's true, I said in uh, the Old Testament, how he led in worship, you know. Um, but then this high position eventually uh, led to his fall. I'm gonna have to come back with Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel, uh, 28 with these guys. Um, I was not prepared for this Satan discussion, so I'm going to have to re-attack this one on a future class. But all great questions. Um, um, talk a little bit more about demon possession and how, you know, in the cold, blood has a lot to do with it, drinking blood or cutting themselves. I don't know how that works, but we did talk about the idea of like, you know, people normally have to be invite or invite demons to possess them. Um, there has to be an opening inviting the demons. Um, so warning to stay away from all kinds of cultish type stuff. That that stuff is real. Um, witchcraft is real. Demon possession, all that stuff, I truly believe is all real. And it's a real danger out there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Nick mentioned the Nephilim, which... By this time, we we're starting to run out towards the end of the hour, so wasn't able to get deep into the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 and the, the Watchers and the Giants and all that. Um, we'll definitely have to re-attack that on a, on a future class, but awesome, awesome questions. There was a lot of interaction um, about the enemy, so definitely going to have to... Uh, come back and do a little bit more prep on the enemy and uh, talk more about him, which again, I think is healthy. I think it's healthy to know how our enemy works in order so that we can, uh, you know, be protected from him. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> continuing with that, we talked about the throne of Satan in Revelation 2, which is what I had them research. Um, Esther found that and she mentioned how there was the temple of Zeus in Pergamum. So on the left there, there's a kind of a drawing, a rendition of the excavated temple of Zeus in Pergamum. Um, it's how it would have looked back during the time that Revelation 2 was penned. Um, it was a temple of Zeus. Um, it had a lot of Greek god imagery on the side there as you can kind of see at the edge of the columns there was columns and then there was a seat in the middle of the column of that u um then mention how adolf hitler actually had an exact replica made of the throne of satan or the temple of zeus in berlin during his rule that was an interesting discussion especially after all the satan and possession discussion you know it came up whoa could Adolf Hitler have been, you know, possessed or influenced by Satan? Definitely. I mean, when you see what that guy did, um, no doubt he definitely had this, at least the spirit of the Antichrist or Satan himself. And kind of suspicious that he had this temple of Zeus, which was known as the throne of Satan in Pergamum. He had a replica made in Berlin. 
uh, during his time. Don't know why. Maybe Satan was physically present there in Berlin um, during the Second World War, during uh, Adolf Hitler's reign. Maybe he had a lot to do with uh, Hitler's uh, influence and plans. Um, and then I mentioned how in Denver, Colorado, in 2008, there was a, uh, a stage that was made that kind of resembled the throne of Satan in Pergamum. Um, there's an uncanny resemblance with the columns and it's not exactly a U shape, but you could kind of see the resemblance. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. It's just something I uh, threw out there. Um, this was in Denver in 2008. Um, there's a stage. And, you know, I mentioned like, well, I hope not, right? I hope this has nothing to do with the throne of Satan and Pergamum. Um, I hope it's just a coincidence, though. I tend to question coincidences, you know. Um, but if Hitler had one done in Berlin and we saw what happened with that country, I just hope that if this is what this is, I hope it don't exist anymore. I don't even know if it does. Again, this was about, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or so that this stage was uh, put up for a certain event. So just something to throw up there to – I want – I want the students to kind of realize, like, you know, this is just not something in history um, or something far off in the future either. Like, this stuff is out there right now. And they got to have an open eye to what's going on out there because it's not it's not really open and clear. I mean, if this stage was built for that purpose, they definitely did not come out and say, the stage is a replica of the throne of Satan in Pergamum. I mean, that wasn't said. Or a replica of the rendition made in the museum in Berlin by Adolf Hitler. That was definitely not said, you know. But with open eyes, you can kind of see kind of a resemblance there. So, again, just a, a plug to just kind of look at, look at the world today and uh, see what's out there and just question everything. Um, examine everything as the Lord said in Revelation 2. Um, examine all claims. Um, so we we ended with um, kind of the essay prompt that they're going to have here due in a couple of weeks, which is really not even, you know, a grammatical exercise. It's more of a journaling exercise. Um, I just wanted to put their thoughts on paper on what they think the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches today. Um, it's very easy to look at Revelation 2 and be like, oh, that was in the past, you know, or it's in the future, whatever. But a lot of the stuff there applies today. Um, I reviewed kind of, uh, okay, well, there's the scripture where con in 2 and 3, chapter 2 and 3, he constantly says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So I ended with reviewing just from chapter 2, um, stuff Jesus likes or wants us to do. For example, like in verse two, he mentioned he likes when work hard or have patient endurance or don't tolerate evil. Um, examine all claims, like I just mentioned, patiently suffer for him without quitting in verse three, um, to not be afraid to suffer. Um, the Lord suffered and we know there's suffering coming and don't be afraid of it, to remain faithful, even if it comes to facing death. We have not talked about the number of the beast or anything of, like that yet. We will get to that. Um, but faith may get tested to the point of death. So throw that in there. We'll talk more about that later. Um, or remaining loyal to Jesus no matter what and never denying him. These are things that Jesus wants us to do, things that he likes. From chapter 2 of Revelation, um, he wants us, verse 19, to love others, um, to have faith, and to serve others. He also mentioned things he didn't like, like not loving him, of course, right? Who doesn't like that? Um, or not doing the works we did at first. We talked. I talked briefly about how, you know, when somebody comes to faith, you're on fire for the Lord, you love the Lord, and you know, as time goes on, you kind of it kind of wears off, you know. Um, we have to kind of be constantly seeking, uh, you know, seeking the Lord and just 
making ourselves continue to get excited um, about them. Um, talking about tripping up the people of Israel, how Jesus doesn't like that, how the people of Israel are special to God and we should never ever go against them or trip them up or be mean to them. Um, if you got any Jewish friends, you need to be friends that, again, we're co-heirs with Israel in God's kingdom. Um, the things we talked about, food offered to idols, committing sexual sin, leading others astray, teaching these things to other people. These are stuff Jesus doesn't like mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. And then we talked about the promises. The promises he gave in chapter 2, if we're victorious, uh, we will go to a place called paradise, uh, which we'll talk about in the uh, Places of the Dead class coming up soon, or how we won't go to the second death in the lake of fire. Uh, more to come on that. Um, and we'll get to go to heaven, eat manna, which must taste delicious. Um, and how we'll receive a new name in heaven. That's kind of cool. And how with Christ, we will rule over all nations, you know, in the, time, in the future to come. So a lot of promises that Jesus gives in Revelation chapter 2 to re remain victorious, um, even in the midst of suffering. So that was the... Uh, that was a discussion today. Awesome discussion. Our next one will be uh, Revelation chapter 3, continuing with the message to the seven churches. And um, I'll post this Sunday the lecture for that. And we'll have that discussion next, next Wednesday. God bless. And uh, we'll see you guys then.